Hello, welcome to Legal Action. My name is David Siegel. Today we're going to be talking about foreclosure as it relates to foreclosure offense and foreclosure defense. Joining me today is my co-host Jesse Barrientes, and we have a special guest, a foreclosure defense practitioner, Sandra Emerson. Sandra, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. How are you doing? I'm very good. Thank Sandra, you for having me. You got it. Tell us a little bit about your background and how you came into the law. Well, I've been practicing now since 1998, and I started out my career in employment discrimination, and I eventually shifted to real estate and then on to foreclosure defense as I saw the need for it. Uh, there were more and more foreclosures and clients that needed my help, and so I was eager to take on the task, and I, and I love doing what I do. That's a nice broad background, Jesse, wouldn't you say, I mean, to, oh, yeah. to get into practice with? Um, Everything comes into play. I mean, you have, because you do have, uh, in some instances, uh, probably there's housing discrimination where I'm sure some of those situations come into play there. Um, but uh, having that broad base of, of everything just can make you better. Yeah. Particularly yes. foreclosure. Let's jump into this because it's, it's a crisis that's been going on for a number of years. Uh, some people have already been displaced from their homes for several years if they were at the beginning of the crisis. And I don't really see an end. Do you? I certainly don't. I see this continuing for the next three to five years and possibly even increasing the next couple of years. And then we might see a drop off after that. What's causing this? What, what's happening out there that's causing people to not be able to make their mortgage? At the beginning, it was the, the arms increasing. But I think it's totally different Right. Now. Well, for many years, the loss mitigation tool of choice was the refinance. And people would just go refinance those arms or just refinance in general. Um, sometimes when their home was increasing in value, they would go refinance and get cash out and then do something with the cash out, maybe take some vacations or pay off some credit cards, that kind of thing. You're familiar with that. The home equity Bankruptcy, loan. that's right. All and, that money right. you can access and use right. for vacations and exactly. boats and, and not rehabs. be able to discharge. Now, now it becomes a non-dischargeable debt. Uh, home theater. Home exactly. theater. Exactly. <laughs> so then when the real estate market began its decline and home values begin to drop, people suddenly found themselves without home equity and unable to refinance those loans. And then if their arms had adjusted and they had a higher payment, there was really nothing left. They would have to stop making their mortgage payments because they simply couldn't afford them anymore. In addition to that, there have been some changes in the economy, obviously. People are unemployed, underemployed, losing bonuses. Uh, businesses are failing. If they're a real estate investor or they have some kind of real estate related business, perhaps a mortgage broker, real estate broker, then those people have been adversely affected as well. But everybody's really, realistically, in the same boat. I mean, when you talk yes. about the economy, that affects everybody. And so right. when you look at, I mean, sure, you can look at those specific areas. And I know some attorneys who did uh, primarily real estate. And when the bottom fell out, I mean, now all the work is gone. I mean, right. sure, there are people doing foreclosure, uh, short sales, and those kind of things. But that's that's a whole lot different than, than before. I used to do a lot more of, uh, of the real estate stuff uh, in my general practice. But of course, now when, when this happens, you're uh, you're all gone, but because everybody's in the same boat, I mean, you know, what does that say for uh, for for the people that aren't, you know, able to take care of those responsibilities? What what, what do you do when when you see that? Hey, listen, it's not going to be able to happen. Say, for example, you know what? Hey, I, I you know we had a, a, an issue where my arm adjusted or whatever. What do I do now? Well, what a lot of people do because they don't know what else to do is they just stop paying their mortgage. Some of them. How they realize that there's government programs out there to help them. For example, the HAMP program, the Making Home Affordable to Get Your Loan Modified or the Principal Reduced. And so they go online and they think, okay, or they call their servicer, okay, maybe I can get my loan modified. And to their shock and surprise, they're told to fall behind on their mortgage. And then they actually go into foreclosure when they weren't before because they're trying to do something about their problem which is really a sad situation. How are the lenders? I know that you've uh, had this uh, as well, but I've, I've heard a lot of people when they come in indicate to me that when they go to apply for a program like that, they're, they're met with great, great resistance and just a tremendous ball of red tape so that it, it's, it's almost like they've just thrown up their hands. I mean, they feel like there's nothing that they can do. That's correct. A lot of people do give up and they come into my office and they say, you know what, I think I'm going to give up my home. And then I tell them, you don't have to. And they're actually surprised a lot of times. 
it doesn't really seem like you can save your home once you get so deep, but it, there definitely is a possibility to do that. Right. I think this has been going on a lot longer than people realize. This goes yes. all the way back to the prior administration. I remember yes. Secretary of the Treasury Paulson stepping up in front of the uh, cameras right. and saying, call your mortgage company, ask them for help. And yet yes. I would have clients come in telling me, I'm getting rejected, I'm getting stonewalled, they don't want to help me. So it seems like every six months or a year later, there was a new program, right. a new initiative, a new way for a small fraction of the people to actually be helped. That doesn't work. And now, <laughs> more and more now, I'm seeing people are actually getting help because I think we're getting towards past the 50% mark of this thing, and the mortgage companies are realizing it's better to work a deal because you're getting help on the back end from the government anyway, than to have another piece of inventory that they have to try and sell. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that, but also I feel like that recent settlement with the eight attorneys general with the major lenders was a, definitely an impetus. I've read a, a couple of the settlement agreements, I confess not, not all of them, but definitely that's having an impact. Okay. But is, I mean, is it, is, it a, is it a nominal impact? Is it, you know, when you, when you look at those kind of things, and it just, I mean, there are just so many people. I mean, do you think it's because people are not aware of those programs or do you think it's yes. because they're not able to be helped by this specific program or what do you think the kind of ratio might be? It's well, it's a combination, I would say. A lot of times people aren't aware that those programs exist because like Dave said, they keep changing the programs. So you might apply for one thing and you find out you don't qualify and you don't know that 6 months later there's something new out there. So you don't do that. If you go on the HAMP website, there are programs for every single right. type of mortgage situation, whether you're in a condo, whether you're a homeowner. And to read the information on that website would take you literally days. It's a job. So it it's is not job. simplified. So that's another reason. People have too many choices and they, they get frustrated. And also they're not filling out the, uh, the packages correctly. Oh, that's well, right. They're it not providing the right documentation that these mortgage companies need to actually make a decision and another thing, too, if there's not a positive cash flow in the budget, they're probably going to get rejected. And that is something that a lot of homeowners are completely unaware of. For example, they're under the impression that they need to be completely broke, they need to have negative cash flow, they need to have no money in the bank. And quite the contrary, they need to have something. Because one of the factors that's evaluated by the banks when they're doing loss mitigation is the risk of redefault. So if you don't have any money and don't have any hope of even making a modified mortgage payment, it's highly unlikely that you'd get one. So if I come to you and I'm retired or if I'm on Social Security or disability or something like that, the chances may not be really good for me. Yes, I would say, you know, perhaps you need a bankruptcy, uh, and I'm sure Dave is familiar with this as well. Sometimes I find that clients come in and their debt-to-income ratio is so high that I say to them, you'd be better served by doing a bankruptcy first and then applying for a loan modification. And I'm I glad you said that because many people feel that they shouldn't file a bankruptcy because they won't get another loan mod. But really, if you do a bankruptcy and you increase your ability to pay right. by eliminating some debt, the mortgage company then sees that and says, well, all this debt's been eliminated, so now you have the ability, if you're working or have other sources of income, to make that modified mortgage payment, and it's a win-win. Absolutely. So, how, does that, how does that really work for the folks at home? So uh, understand, debt-to-income ratio, absolutely. You get rid of the, the bills that now you don't have before, so you have all this. But if you do a bankruptcy, and of course your property is necessarily, it has to be included in the bankruptcy, then uh, what... What is kind of the interplay? With well, it's included in the bankruptcy, but it's still a secured item. So if a person wants to keep their home, they can continue to make those payments. But they've eliminated Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Discover, medical bills, personal loans, past due utilities, maybe an auto deficiency is gone, maybe some old tax debt is gone. So now the person really just has their normal utilities and their outstanding mortgage and or second mortgage. That's right. So Additionally, the bankruptcy can be a sound strategic tool in your foreclosure defense. And the reason why is because when the bank is doing NPV, which is the net present value test that they use to determine whether or not it's profitable for them to do a loan modification, they're factoring in that they'll eventually obtain a deficiency judgment against you in a potential foreclosure action. If you do a bankruptcy, then that potential is completely eliminated and that actually helps the NPV test for the borrower. 
Right. Let's uh, just because I, I want to make sure that the folks at home kind of know kind of what we're we're talking about. We're throwing around a lot of terms. We are. When you say a deficiency judgment, uh, that's sort of like just to make a really easy example. For example, a car. Your car gets repossessed. You owe ten thousand dollars on your car. They sell it for two thousand dollars. That's so about right. The deficiency. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's about right. right. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. So 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 the difference is eight thousand dollars, and yes, that's the deficiency, right? right? No, I just want right. to make sure that you right. know that they that they're that they're understanding out there exactly what we're talking about. And so, of course, with the with the property, that amount is going to be greater because it's going to include all kinds of interest and penalties and uh, attorney's fees and other fees. Right. And now well. the properties are underwater. So that means the sale price on that home from an eventual foreclosure is going to be very, very low, which means the potential for a deficiency, a large deficiency, is very, very high. And here in Illinois, we're what they call a deficiency state, meaning that if they sell the home for less than what you owe, they can get a judgment for the difference. Well, let me let me ask you about that because again, we've talked about it in one context in terms of being able to get your loan modification, but realistically, uh, after they do the foreclosure, mm -hmm. and now we get the judgment, we get the deficiency judgment uh, as the lender. Are there some counties that are, uh, you know, really? not kind of allowing those things to, even though Illinois is a deficient state, are they kind of really shying away from that or, or not really fond about lenders uh, or, or even not even granting those types of judgments? You're right. You have a very good point. In Cook County, that is the case at, at this point in time. And I think that's because each judge in the Chancery Division in Cook County has in excess of 8,000 cases apiece. And they don't want to turn into a debt collection court, and that's understandable. But that could always change, and I understand that more and more cases are, are actually seeking deficiencies. The Plaintiff's Council are doing that. So I think it is best for people to, no matter what county they're in, to consider a bankruptcy very, very seriously. In fact, if you have a second mortgage, I absolutely recommend it, if at all possible, because the second mortgage holder can get even more because their lien is going to be extinguished in the foreclosure. So they can go in on a separate action against the homeowner and try to collect it all. But with the bankruptcy? With the bankruptcy, they can't do that. Okay. Let's talk about the process. Someone comes to see you. Okay. They haven't made their mortgage payment for about six to nine months. Okay. They just received a foreclosure summons. Okay, that's the best time for someone to come to see me. Yeah, uh, someone people, has hand delivered, right. either a, by sheriff or a special process server, a 60 or 80 page document. Yeah, it's about right. Foreclosure, <laughs> complaint, summons, with the mortgage mm -hmm. and the note attached, and there's a future status date, and they are scared to death oh, yes. that they're gonna have to be out of that house shortly. Right. What do you do? Right. How do well, we start this case? Well, it's very difficult at first to assure people that they still have a significant amount of time in their home because they're still the record owner of the property and the, the bank cannot kick them out. So that's the first thing we do is try to set their fears at ease by giving them a timeline of what's going to happen in the foreclosure. And I give the clients an honest view of what would happen whether or not I represent them. I feel like it's only the fair thing to do. And in all of my consultations, I discuss their different options. So if bankruptcy is an option, we talk about that. If they want to know, if can I do a short sale, we talk about that. So I don't just focus on selling the client on a foreclosure defense. In some cases, it really isn't appropriate. So I, I won't recommend it, even though I may not represent that particular client. That's fine, because I want what's best for the client. Okay. Let's say they tell you straight up, we can't keep the house, we can't afford the house but we want to extend the time that we have in the house because we know eventually we're going to have to go rent somewhere. So we want you mm -hmm. to defend this action, get us as much time as possible, and we're going to pay you for that service. Where do we go from here? Wow. Uh, that is generally not the case that I would take, although I know there are certainly a lot of attorneys that do, and I, certainly that's, that's fine. But that's not typically the case that I normally take. Uh, my focus is on home preservation and home ownership, and so our practice is focused on cases where we have real genuine defenses and where we feel like the client can, with a modified payment or a principal reduction or something like that, actually afford their home and keep it. Well, let's talk let's about some of those defenses. defenses. Yeah, right? Right. Exactly. What, wow. uh, what are some uh, defenses that, uh, that people, I mean, because people are thinking, and, you know, I've even, you know, told people, I mean, realistically, when you really look at it, mm -hmm. okay, this is the home that you signed a, a contract on, essentially, right. right? You were supposed to pay a mortgage of whatever. You haven't paid that mortgage. You haven't paid it for the last nine months, 
even two years sometimes. I had somebody recently who hadn't paid in just a, an incredible amount of time, and they hadn't done anything until recently, I mean, in terms of the lender coming on in, right? So realistically, you owe the money. Well, certainly you owe them money, but as, as Dave could probably tell you, even let's say you are uh, unemployed temporarily and then you want to come back and pay. You, you have a job again. You've got money again. Guess what? They won't take your money. After 90 days, they're going to accelerate the loan, which means call the whole thing due. Right. You know, that's mm -hmm. what the mortgage says. Hey, we want all of it now. We don't just want your monthly payment. Just pay us the whole 200000 or whatever it is. And, of course, you don't have it. And so what can you do? So that's why a lot of people haven't paid. The top reason we find that people haven't paid their mortgages, they've been told to fall behind by their loan servicer. That's the entity that takes those payments on behalf of the lender from them. So they call and they say, I can't afford my payment. I'm unemployed or I'm underemployed. And then they say, well, we can't help you. Can you get 60 days behind, please? And then after 60 days, you say, okay, I'm ready now. I need help. And they say, you know what? You should really be 90 days behind. That's what I find is the problem. And then people come in and they say, you know what, I'm trying to pay. Another thing we see a lot of, which is an absolute disgraceful practice on behalf of the servicers, is the trial period plan payment under the Making Home Affordable Modification Plan. So a what they call a TPP is extended to the borrower. And they say, okay, now your payment is $900 a month for three months. At the end of the three months, we'll modify your mortgage. So the borrower pays for three months, six months, nine months. I had a client that paid for 10 months. And then you know what they do? They just pull the rug out from under you and say the whole thing's due. And they foreclose anyway. Yeah. One of the things I see, unfortunately, in the, in the bankruptcy arena is clients will be offered this trial period for three months. And what I often see is the clients pay the three months, they don't get the modification, like you said, and the client has essentially covered the mortgage company's legal fees right. to bring right. the foreclosure action. So that's what I consider those three months. But then again, there's those cases where sometimes they do get the modification subsequent to three months of timely payment. So you can't say for sure they're not going to get it, but it is a, a gamble. Depends it's, on the, the lender or the servicer. It's rare, but the good news is, uh, I believe it was in March, the Seventh Circuit came down with the Why God decision. I believe it was Wells Fargo Bank, and it was a, a really good case for homeowners everywhere because in that case, the borrowers had a trial period uh, payment plan, and they were not granted a permanent modification. And, and the Seventh Circuit said, you can't do that. That is a contract, and you have to honor it. So if they've paid their trials, they are supposed to get a permanent modification. So that's one of the defenses, then? Yes, and I'm very excited about that case. It's just a watershed decision, and it was just a great day for foreclosure defense attorneys everywhere, I can yeah. tell you. Sort of like promissory yeah. estoppel, right? That's right. That's there's, right. there's so many cases like that that we've seen. There are also technical defenses, which may be too technical to discuss here in detail. Let's but, briefly just yeah. mention those, because people are are aware of them, they just don't understand them. Okay, certainly. Uh, you might have a case where uh, Bank of America is the plaintiff, but you look at the note and the note says Wells Fargo, that's who the borrower made the note to. Well, you can't bring a case with someone else's note. It's just like a check. So if I have a check that says to David Siegel and I take that to the bank, I'm not supposed to be able to cash that check, correct? correct. It's the same thing with these mortgage notes. If it hasn't been assigned, appropriately. Right, so these notes will be missing an endorsement. And, and when, you, when you're looking at those, because in a, in a foreclosure you have to have all of the necessary parties. Right. Which means pretty much, well, we, we've learned a long time in, in pretty much every area of the law, okay, usually if anybody's had a hand on it, okay, that's that's who right. you're going to go after and take care of. But if it's been, uh, for example, assigned to somebody appropriately, but there's also a process then for that assignment. Right. Maybe when you first bought your house and you have your closing package, and that's what I, you know, when we did closings uh, before the bottom kind of fell out, there was mm -hmm. always a, a, a doc that you signed that indicated that it, you know, it, it could be assigned, uh, you know, pretty or much not. at any time. Or not. Or not. Uh, or that it could be serviced or sold. And sometimes right there at the table, it was, it was sold or assigned yes, to somebody right. else right then in there. That's correct. Wholesale lenders. Right. Exactly. Some of the big outfits. And a lot of these mortgages that were made between 2002 and 2007 were also sold into securitized trust pools. So there's a, a pool of loans and that uh, pool of loans is actually sold on uh, the stock market. You know, it's part of somebody's 
uh, portfolio for retirement or something like that. And they actually register this pool of loans with the Securities and Exchange Commission. You can find those documents available online. And there will be a pooling and servicing agreement. There's a mortgage loan purchase agreement, all those kind of things. And so there are a lot of technical defenses based on that loan securitization that can be brought. So just because I'm curious too, and I think folks are, uh, because you know a lot of people are going to be looking at their documents now whenever they get that to make sure. Oh, and they should, so yes. So what happens then when you have a situation like that when it's somebody else? Does that mean that the lawsuit is over? Does that mean it gets dismissed? Or does that mean that they, the lender gets a chance to correct the deficiency? Well, generally, I bring in those situations where I feel that there clearly is no authority for the plaintiff to bring the complaint. I generally bring a motion to strike and dismiss the complaint. Now, I generally practice in Cook County. So in Cook County, the remedy is typically to just strike the complaint and order an amendment. It won't, the case won't actually be dismissed outright as it is in other states. Illinois is a little bit different in, in the way we apply foreclosure case law, sure. apparently, compared to Florida, Ohio, New York, California, pretty much anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we have a, just a different way of doing things. Uh, our law is a little bit different than some of the states. Some of the cases that people read about on the internet, I have clients that come into the office and they say, well, can't you do it like this? There's a quiet title action here, but they're thinking about Florida law or Massachusetts law. For example, in Massachusetts, if you're filing a foreclosure, I believe you have to have the assignment of mortgage to do that. That's not true in Illinois because the purpose of an assignment of mortgage in Illinois is only to give record notice to parties that might have an interest. So an assignment isn't necessary in Illinois to even be in writing. So it's the actual endorsement on the note that we look for. How about as a term that a lot of people have heard, I've heard that that people, they might not know exactly what it means, but I hear that a lot when people come in, is robo-signing. Robo-signing, yes, that is absolutely rampant. And it is, uh, I have it in a lot of my cases, and so I don't want to give out any names, sure. but, but certainly anybody that has a note uh, that's endorsed by a, a person, if they want to, before they come into the office, if they wanted to go on Google and maybe just Google the name, a lot of times that robo-signing uh, evidence will come to light. They'll see class action suits where that person's name is mentioned or sometimes a deposition posted online. And You're talking about the note or the assignment of the note? On the note or the assignment, actually. So when, Sometimes when you, both. When you say robo-signing, uh, tell the folks what that exactly means. I mean, right. it, it And there's a famous good. woman who was actually a man. What's the person's name? It was Linda Green. Minutes. Linda, Linda Green, Green was yes. on 60 Minutes, yes. yes. And so that was... He was um, signing for Linda Green. And actually, there were a number of people, I believe, not just him, but I think he was the one that was willing to talk to the news. Yeah. He but couldn't yes. stomach it anymore. He had right. guilt was... But they'll have people sitting around at a table. They said they chose Linda Green because the name was very easy and fast to write. And for $10 an hour, he would just sign Linda Green all day long. Uh, there's another one that's pretty famous, Tawana Thomas. And Tawana Thomas had maybe 10 or 12 different versions of her signature floating around. You'll find also now, it's acceptable in Illinois, it depends on what state, but robo-stamping as well. Stamping where, yeah. the <laughs> So the signature yep. isn't even handwritten. Now that is acceptable to do, but it's, what we can do is we can look at how many stamps are out there, whether or not the people who wielded the stamp had the power of attorney of the name that's on the stamp, whether they actually authorized the signature. And is this how you win these cases, or is this they amend after that point? Well, a lot of times we settle the cases. And what, so. what's the uh, what's what's a first what's a what's a win and what's a settlement? And what would you consider a win uh, in terms of a situation? Wow, it depends on the individual client and their goals. And so we take the time to really sit down and thoroughly get to know what the client's goals are, and we reevaluate throughout the case because sometimes their goals change. Well, let's say they so, want to stay. Yeah. The yeah so for some clients, a win might be a modification. Other clients might say, well, you know what, this modification is still a payment that's unacceptable to me. I like a principal reduction. So we might try to see if we can get a principal reduction. Other times, clients just give up in the middle, sadly, and they say, I'm, I'm tired of the process. I think I just want to just quit. Well, when you say principal reduction, essentially, that's the initial amount of the loan where they're basically the, the bank is going to eat that whatever that amount is. Right. Now, and, and people should know that that is very, very rare. And so we try not to encourage people to get too excited about that potential 
uh, result. I would like for that to happen. And it's happening more now thanks to the PRA HAMP program, which is the Principal Reduction Alternative HAMP program that the government has instituted. But still, principal reductions are few and far between. And when they're happening, it's because the value of the home has dropped so low. Mm -hmm. So usually what happens then in, in the other kind of alternative is where they just tack the balance that you want to the back of the loan. Onto so the back, you, that's right. You're still going to pay it. Essentially, I'm just going to lower your rate and extend it out for another 30 whatever years uh, and hope that you're going to pay it. That's right. It's called a waterfall. So what happens in the waterfall is first we start dropping the interest rate about an eighth of a point at a time until we get down to the floor. With HAMP, it's a 2% floor on the interest rate. If it's an in-house modification, the servicer can go down as low as 1%. If the payment still is not at an affordable level, the next step in the waterfall is to start going up in terms of the months that are left on the loan, up to a maximum of 480 months. So. A lot of times people look and say, oh my gosh, I can't believe that this is going to cost this much. And so sometimes they might get the modification and decide to default after that. And they decide to just give up. Uh, it, it's depressing, but it is a very real result and people should be aware that that's what could happen. If the loan is extended out that far, aren't they essentially renting? They are essentially renting, and that's why a lot of times I tell clients, you know, whether or not you decide to take the loan modification depends on one thing can you rent as cheaply as this? So if your rent to rent something comparable in your neighborhood is about the same as your modification payment, maybe you could just take it. And then later you could always, you could always do a bankruptcy if you need to. Yeah. I guess you just have to change the mindset that you're not sure. developing or building equity. You're in effect renting. Correct. But you're able to stay in your own place. You don't That's have correct. to relocate. Yeah, uh, you get to stay. The kids don't have to change schools. Right. There are some benefits to renting your own place, so to speak. Oh, absolutely. And just think about the cost of moving. If you have a good sized house, it could be thousands of dollars to move. That is true. Yeah, it's the one thing I don't enjoy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's no, it's moving. terrible. <laughs> yeah, but there's other people that move around all the time every That's year true. from one rental to another. But just when you have right a house out. full of things and a family, it's right. very difficult. But particularly that's, that's, with kids. Particularly with mm -hmm. kids. But, but that, that is the American dream, right, for everybody, is to yes. own your piece of the American pie, which is to own your home and to have that white picket fence uh, and, to, and, to, and to call it mine. Right. But you need to think about what you can afford. Right. It was the dream, and now I'm, I'm sad to say that's changing as people are beginning to see the reality because it doesn't seem worth it sometimes to pay two or 300000 more for your house than it's really it's worth, worth. And so some people are actually choosing the strategic default method. They're actually choosing to just do a bankruptcy and, and then just leave the home. Yeah, I, I wish it didn't have to be that way. Yeah. And websites like Zillow.com could be very depressing when people look up the value wow. of their home and they see a, a picture of the whole neighborhood, basically, or right. several blocks, and they see it's completely depressed in terms of the values based on what they paid. It could be very depressing yeah. and someone could say, why, why am I paying for this? Exactly. So sometimes so. people just choose not to. But we don't, we don't decide for the client. That's one thing that's really important about our practice is we let the client make the decision because in the end, uh, what you feel about your home and what you want to do with it is up to you. But it sounds like you're encouraging people to stay in their home. Where I handle people after a bankruptcy where it doesn't make any sense for them to really stay. All right. Well, it depends. If, if they really don't have any attachment to the home or don't need to stay, then certainly, you know, we, we feel like if you need to do that, you need to do that. But in terms of taking the foreclosure case, we don't generally do not defend a case where the client says, I just don't want to keep it. I just want to extend the time in there. Okay. Sandra Emerson, thank you very much for thank the uh, foreclosure information. On behalf of Jesse Barrientes, my name is David Siegel. We've been talking about foreclosure, and we'll see you next time on Legal Action. Take care. Thank you.